Hi, hello, welcome to the fourth video lecture in the combined streams of teaching in economic policy and managerial economics. This time uh, I'm going to treat a particular topic uh, which is like a staple topic in economic policy and in general in understanding uh, policies that governments adopt regarding business namely the policies that governments can adopt as regards technological change. And right now we have, among many aspects of technological change, we can one, uh, or we, we have one technological change, which is quite important. In a moment I will develop on this more in detail. And it is the growth, the development of a technology called cloud computing. So I give a title to that lecture, The Growth of Cloud Computing and What Can Governments Do About It? Let's waltz! So maybe I will magnify the slide to make it better readable. Okay, so and I will get even smaller in that slide. So there is a big technological change that happens. Uh, digital technologies in general drift into something called the cloud computing. Uh, in the slide here, you have links, for example, to investors relations sites of Microsoft, of IBM, and of another company called Okta. Uh, as usually, this video lecture is accompanied by this PowerPoint presentation downloadable from the archives of my blog. So if you look into the description box below the video, you can find the link to download that PowerPoint presentation. You can find those links there. And cloud computing in general is very much what you deal with when you use Netflix. Huh? You have huge servers, or rather entire networks of servers. On those servers, you have a lot of data, because when you deal with Netflix, you deal with data. Videos are data as well. And there is a set of algorithms of artificial intelligence, or as we call it, a set of artificial neural networks which do their best to adapt uh, that data on servers and the way those servers work to the perceived behavior of users, of end users. This is more or less cloud computing. In the slide, for example, you have a link uh, to a whole bunch of functionalities developed by Microsoft in terms of cloud computing which is called Microsoft Azure. You have a link in, uh, in the slide. If you go there, and I strongly encourage you to go and follow this link, you will understand better what cloud computing is. Essentially, it means that the amount of data that our civilization has is sufficient to generate completely new types of functionalities. But in order to generate those functionalities, you need powerful servers, much more powerful than any individual computer. So the idea is to put data on that big servers, use artificial intelligence to manage that data, and then miracles happen. Completely new solutions can appear. So this is an example of deep technological change. If you follow uh, the investor relations site, uh, sites of Microsoft or IBM, you can see that cloud computing grows into a completely different business segment. And just for your curiosity, IBM has just announced that they will essentially split IBM in two parts, in two separate companies. and. Uh, Cloud computing will be one of those companies. So it grows into a completely separate segment of the digital business. And there is like a common historical knowledge among governments, among rulers. When there is a technological 
change taking place, governments cannot stay indifferent or they'd better not stay indifferent. They need to take a stance. They need to adopt a policy regarding that technological change. Now let's go a little bit more into that claim that governments need to take a stance as regards any deep technological shift. First of all, governments use technologies. They use technologies, for example, for security, internal and external. Uh, besides, technologies generate business activity and business activity in turns in it in turn gives a tax base to governments so governments really need to pay attention to what their tax base uh, runs on in terms of technologies and uh, governments need to be sort of smart about deep technological shifts which happen in their countries and which happen internationally uh, it is like a historical experience that when the government stays indifferent or lags behind such technological change, the country gets weaker, the government gets weaker, and generally the government gets in trouble. Uh, so governments, on the one hand, need to adopt the new technology, and they need to pay attention to what business people do as regards this technology. And, as I announced in my uh, previous video lecture, in that course or in those combined courses of economic policy at managerial economics, this semester, so the winter semester of 2020-2021, I want to focus or I want to encourage you, my students, to focus on public policies that can serve to recover economically from the economic shock caused by the pandemic. And once again, it is sort of a common historically developed political knowledge that embracing like the right technological wave is a good strategy for governments to get out of economic crisis. And now I suggest you, let me get smaller in the slide, I suggest you a possible topic for your project in any of those two courses, economic policy or managerial economics. Consider four alternative fiscal strategy, which could be sort of workable uh, for economic recovery amidst the pandemic. And those strategies are precisely related to the deep technological change observable as the growth of cloud computing technologies and cloud computing business. I uh, tried to illustrate those strategies in the table below. So in columns, you have two types of like cash flows, two types of treasury flows, uh, which uh, the government can have. It can be money collected in taxes, for one, and it can be money borrowed in the capital market by the issuance of sovereign bonds. So those two cash flows can be used in two different ways. Uh, in the first row of the table, uh, there is a hypothesis that governments can use those cash flows to sort of support, enhance and reinforce that emerging technological wave, so cloud computing in this case. And uh, in the second row, I consider or I give for your consideration the opposite fiscal strategy which consists in using those cash flows from taxes and from the issuance of sovereign bonds to support other economic sectors or other business sectors. So there the assumption is that uh, the new technology, the new emerging technology 
can anyway take care of itself if it already does but what needs support are other sectors so when so there the idea is to collect money through taxes or through borrowing precisely from the industry of cloud computing and redirect it to other sectors of the economy. So those uh, four strategies, I can now quickly comment on them, phrase them out as we are by that slide. So strategy number one, the government levies taxes from other sectors of the economy to speed up growth in the most promising one, so in the industry of cloud computing. Next to the right is a strategy where the government borrows money from the financial sector in exchange of sovereign bonds and supports the most promising sector in business, namely cloud computing. Then immediately in the row below, you have a strategy where the government levies taxes from the most dynamically growing sector, cloud computing in this case, in order to support those relatively weaker sectors of the economy. And finally, the fourth strategy is that the government borrows money from the financial sector in exchange of sovereign bonds in order to support the relatively weak sectors in business. So we have like two types of cash flows, two different strategies uh, as for approaching technological change. And it gives you like four strategies, four fiscal strategies, which you can uh, consider as mutually exclusive or complementary. So the idea precisely in your project is like to think if you were the government in the presence of this specific technological change and in the presence of the pandemic and the necessity to recover economically amidst and after the pandemic, what would you do? What combination of those strategies would you use and how? So you can build your graduation essay around that specific dilemma or that specific strategic choice on the part of governments. Now that table involves a little bit of strategy, a, li a little bit of theory, excuse me, to dig into. Uh, essentially you need to get familiar with types of taxes. In a moment I will cursorily develop on these. So you could do with distinguishing direct taxes from indirect taxes cash flow based taxes from the capital based ones, then you need to understand the so-called fiscal equation, which says that the current public expenditures of a government are always financed by the sum of taxes collected and by current borrowing, so by the increment in public debt. And finally, you could do with understanding sovereign bonds and public borrowing. As sometimes I like sort of jump through my material, this time I will start from the last bullet point. So I will quickly flip to the last slide in the presentation. So to sovereign bonds and public borrowing. So sovereign bonds and public borrowing, and there are some like common rules or principles that govern that aspect of fiscal policies in governments. So, first of all, governments routinely borrow money in financial markets to cover their current budgetary deficits or even above the necessity to cover those deficits. This is this first bullet point. Huh? Now, as I go to the second bullet point, uh, there is another regularity. Governments essentially don't borrow money by simple bank credit. Historically, it proved a little bit dysfunctional. What governments do is that they issue a special category of financial securities called sovereign bonds. 
and they uh, which are tradable financial securities which embody financial obligations of the government and it is like a piece of common political knowledge that uh, banks willingly buy those sovereign bonds why because the sovereign bonds are associated with relatively low credit risk if you are a bank if you have a sufficient amount of sovereign bonds in your balance sheet then uh, you can go like more boldly into crediting or into lending money to for example startup businesses which are associated with much higher credit risk and uh, the peculiar trait of sovereign bonds as financial instruments is that given that capacity to drive down the overall credit risk in banks banks have like more interest in holding sovereign bonds uh, than in seeing them bought back by the government so the public debt so the sum total the total value of all sovereign bonds issued by governments can be considered as a sort of floating mass of capital which balances or regulates the overall credit risk of the banking sector. Now we go to the fiscal equation of the government. Let me go a little bit higher in the window. So this is that equation which says that current public expenditures are equal to the sum, to the arithmetical sum of taxes collected and of the increment in public debt so of the total value of sovereign bonds issued. This translates into two basic principles. First of all, the government can spend as much money in the given fiscal year as it can raise in taxes and borrow from the financial market. No more. And secondly, when we stretch that principle over time, it means that the future capacity of the government to collect taxes and borrow from financial markets depends on how well they will develop their tax base and their borrowing capacity today. So essentially the fiscal equation, if you understand it well, tells you that being a government is very largely like being a business. You need to take care of your operational base and of your capital base and your borrowing capacity. And finally, a quick review of taxes or, or types of taxes. You can do a little bit of your own research on that. Uh, we generally distinguish between direct taxes, uh, which are directly collected from the taxpayers. And income taxes are the best example. Although you have other taxes of the type, for example, in Poland, you have a tax on dogs and this is a direct tax because you need as a taxpayer to pay it directly to the local government. On the other hand, you have taxes such as value added tax. Whatever we buy legally, we pay a margin of value added tax in the total price that we pay at the cash desk. And uh, this is a tax which essentially is being paid just to the extent of the economic activity of taxpayers. If you stop buying goods, you stop paying the value added tax. Whilst direct taxes like income taxes, they are due and they are being paid regardless of the current economic activity of taxpayers. Uh, so essentially direct taxes usually are taxes on what we earned in the past, whilst indirect taxes usually are taxes on what we are doing right now in terms of economic activity. And finally, taxes may, may be based on the current cash flows that taxpayers have or on the assets they own. For example, there is a tax on real estate which is an example of the latter. And essentially, uh, historically, cash flow based taxes have prevailed over the capital based ones. Huh? Back in the day, like, for example, if you go back, let's say, 400 years ago or 300 years ago, most taxes were capital based taxes. Today, 
most taxes, the great majority of taxes are based on current cash flows that taxpayers have. Okay, that would be all in that video lecture. So I gave you a specific topic to consider for as a possible uh, rabbit hole to go into and to go down um, in order to write your graduation essay in the course of economic policy or in the course of managerial economics. So now, as usually, have fun with science and have fun with life. Bye.